Good morning, everybody. Welcome. So nice to see you all. Um, this is our sixth monthly meeting of the Residence Council in our 60th year. We intend to celebrate this anniversary this year with a party in late summer. Watch for information about that. The council will be in recess for the month of July. That's traditional. And so our next meeting will be held in August. Today's agenda, have it up there yet? The agenda includes the usual business and two spotlighted committees, along with Joan Hudson, the administration's communication manager, and of course, Mike Ostrom, our CEO. So here to start us off is our CEO with administration updates. Okay. You know, if you if if you can't, if you can't get the applause, then come equipped, right? Build in your own applause. You know, I mean, I've got other ones too. Yeah, we could go on for hours. All right. Well, welcome. Thank you all for being here and inviting me. I enjoy having a chance to come and give some updates. Uh, we're going to cross our fingers. You see, our, you know, our half of our IT brain trust is here trying to make sure all of this stuff works. And, you know, we do work on this. I want everyone to know, you know, we don't take it lightly. This is something that, you know, we're working hard on. And people say, well, just kind of plug it in, make it play. What's the big deal? Well, it's just not plug and play. So there are only a couple of organizations that companies that really provide the kind of Com uh, complex tools and systems, K4 being one of them, and they're relatively new to our industry. And so we're working with the developers to help make things work. And I know we've had our glitches with running movies and doing things. It's not because we don't know what's going on. It's just we're on the phone to these guys. We're talking with them about the glitches, working through the programming. And we ask more of our technology than most of our, our peers do because of how many things we integrate, our own content, YouTube, um, HHTV, and so on. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying, you know, it's, it is a work in process and we're committed to getting it right and our IT group works hard at it. So cut them some slack, even though it's very frustrating at times. Okay. Uh, so happy belated Father's Day to those of you who are fathers. I had a great opportunity to be with both of my kids, which is great. Uh, you know, they've passed me up in every conceivable way. So I guess that's a good note. Either that or I set a really low bar, <laughs> which might be the case. Uh, the Juneteenth uh, display uh, in Fireside Lounge, you've seen that around here. I think that's a great acknowledgement of our commitment to diversity and, uh, that was put up by our recognition team. So we try to do these things to recognize things and help remind everybody, you know, what we value here and what we care about. Community uh, Retirement Week, uh, that was pretty fun. Uh, you saw a lot of, you know, bright colors and you saw the uh, a great participation in the buying the, the, the cards, uh, the bright spot cards. And, you know, I, I, I got a, a bunch of them and I don't certainly don't look for that stuff, but I do, you know, I kind of do appreciate. And I, I think all of our staff appreciate when you notice something. There's plenty of opportunity to tell us when you don't do something right. It's kind of nice to get that little, okay, you know, you're not as bad as we say you are often. <laughs> so thank you for that. Bake sale, that was uh, good. Always uh, a lot of contributions by people who step up their baking game once a year at least. Uh, with respect to our strategic planning, you know, I know there are people who think, oh, well, they're just going to do the West Tower and, you know, they, they're already decided. This is just all window dressing. Well, I got to tell you, it's just not. Um, you know, these are things that we got to take really seriously. We do not want to make a mistake here. 
Uh, and we have to go through a fairly thoughtful analytical process, which I keep repeating so that it's clear. It's the three legs of the stool. It is the, it is the, the, the building and its design and ability to be on that site. It is the cost and the financing, and it is the market demand for that product. And we work all three of them. The one we're working on now is more on the design side. You know, they've been drilling. I thought they were drilling for oil out here, but apparently not. They were drilling for soil samples to make sure that we are putting up something or can put up something that will be sustainable on that, that piece of property. We'll find out what they say. Uh, and the cost is, you know, ridiculous. Uh, and we just have to make sure it all pencils. I want to assure people that these are self-financing buildings. We don't look to the endowment for our money. We don't look to increase your fees. In fact, the idea behind these buildings, when you do these every 10, 15 years, is so that fees don't have to increase. Why? Because you get to spread your costs over more uh, resident fees and not have to increase. One of our peers, uh, who shall remain nameless, is increasing their fees 8.5% in July, and that's the second time this year, okay? That means they will have increased their fees 13%, over 13% in 2022. We had a 4.5% increase. We do what we can do to make sure that we do not ratchet up our resident fees. We don't want you going through this. We don't need you having anxiety. You have enough anxiety with our technology. We don't want you to have anxiety over the fee structure, you know, you got to pick and choose. So, you know, that is why we build these things every so often. And I'm, I'm sorry it happens or could happen on your watch. Uh, lots of cohorts come through Horizon House and never have that experience. And then there are those times when that building is on the, on the, on the table, and we'll see. But the cost is our biggest bugaboo now, and we'll have to see how that shakes out. Uh, but we're working it hard and trimming it up and trying to make it manageable. But you know what? If it doesn't pencil, it doesn't pencil. We're not going to do something stupid here. Uh, we have had all of our resident meetings with the West Wing and the West Facing Central Tower folks. That was 77 meetings, okay? 77 meetings. I don't know any community that does that. And we learned a lot and we heard a lot and we factored that in so that we're able to put that in the calculus of what do we need to do for folks to make you know, an unpalatable situation as palatable as possible. So now we are assembling that data, coming up with ways in which we will approach things for West Wing residents and for West Facing Central Tower residents, come up with some constructs, review that in the fall, giggle test it with residents in the big picture. Each is a negotiation or a, a discussion individually. So we, we're not going to say one size fits all. Uh, but we'll at least give you an idea of the direction we're going and make sure that people, you know, perceive fairness. And then we'll, once we kind of lock that down, then going into 23, if we decide to do this, then we'll begin that execution process and we'll keep everybody informed. I try to give everybody an update every other week, tell you what's going on. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, try to stay at least a little bit ahead of the rumor mill, but it's pretty hard because it's a really, really efficient rumor mill. <laughs> this is down to perfection and it's hard to keep up, but I'm, I am doing my best. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to uh, to see either in person uh, or on uh, the replay of the Mayor Harrell event. Uh, we talked about it before, but, you know, we are able to get the mayor to show up. And I think that's impressive. Uh, you know, he's got a busy schedule. And the fact that he is willing to, to get uh, to us, wasn't here in person, but was on Zoom. Uh, and we joined with Mirabella and with Skyline for that. And we you know, we're a voting body that has a point of view and they know it. So it's good for all the people here who sponsor like Women League of Voters and who really encourage this because this is a reputation we have and that's how we get people to show up here and answer our questions. We will be having the, uh, the Pride Parade and Barbecue on Friday, June 24th. So that's coming up here this Friday. That's gonna be some fun. Uh, it'll be uh, the Parade Thing starts Fireside Lounge at 2.30. And then we'll have the barbecue from three to five in the Parkview Terrace. And I think I rumor has it that summer has arrived, is threatening to arrive, might arrive. We're crossing our fingers that it arrives. Um, so the, the alert will have more details if, if, if you need that. Uh, I'll have my CEO monthly report thing. Um, in that, you know, I, I, there's a lot of stuff and maybe it doesn't all appeal to everybody, but it's another way in which we communicate. And I put in there a section on perspective. 
In my perspective section is, you know, I'm not trying to be profound here. I'm just trying to communicate stuff that's on my head. And, you know, if it's not of interest, you just toss it. But, you know, hopefully it resonates at times with each of you. And this particular topic, I talk about the distrust we have in our society at large and how it filters down among even the most trustworthy of us and how we have to be intentional about, about making sure that we can maintain trust. You know, call out what needs to be called out, but there are other things that maybe we can do, all of us, myself and my team, everybody uh, can be wiser about how we, you know, be more trustworthy of people who deserve to have that trust. So read it if you're interested. Uh, the next fireside chat will be on the, on, oh my gosh, coming up on Friday. I am going to be in Hawaii. Now, yeah, well, yeah, uh huh. It's going to be raining uh, pretty much the entire time. So I looked at the weather report. My wife is going, "What that is going on here?" Because we were trying to escape the rain, and now we're going to go right to it. But uh, we have a guest host, Lori Warfield Larson, who always does a great job. So please welcome her on Friday. And uh, that's it for now. Thank you so much. And now I've got to introduce Connie Hillier. Connie, Connie. Hi. A bit of council business. The uh, minutes of the last meeting have been circulated to the council members. So I'm now formally presenting them for um, approval. Okay. Is there a second among you council members? So we have two seconds here. And we have a motion to approve the minutes and it has been seconded. So all in favor say aye. aye. And opposed? No. So the motion has passed. Thank you. Our next presenter is our treasurer, Diane Tinker. Well, we had another great month. Monday markets just doing so well and our expenses are still down. So our, the, the slides up there shows our May income was 10,000 and our expenses were only three. No, okay, our expenses were only around three. So we had net income for May of 8,000. So our year to date income 21,000 expenses 8500 something so year to date net income 13000 on july 1st we will make one of our two semi annual donations to philanthropy so charlene and do you want to come up okay so twice a year Residence Council makes a donation to philanthropy of $7,500. And they have asked us this year to make it to the endowment partners in carry. So I'm just presenting a symbolic check to Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. Can I say a few words? Yes, and then you say. I want to thank the Residence Council for this. And I looked up in the uh, history and back in 1967, the Residence Council back then decided to do and start this creative um, culture of giving. And they have honored that for the last 55 years. And the Residence Council has continued to help with the culture of giving here at Horizon House. So thank you very much. May I now introduce Jennifer Stucker. Hello, everybody. Okay, I will. Okay, since the last um, report to the General Resident Council meeting, which was May 17th, the market has experienced the following. Um, total deposit for the, those five weeks is 12,862. And um, the employee purchases for those five weeks totaled 1,472. 
So the employees are doing a great job of supporting the market as well as um, all of the residents and the residents' family and some of the people from the general community. Um, a couple of things to note. Um, on Sunday, the 12th, two models were Monday market outfits around Horizon House and through the dining room. At the Father's Day brunch, two new models made the rounds twice around the dining room in two different outfits. And I followed them taking photos. Um, they were well received and people seemed to enjoy the entertainment. Uh, the market outreach will be repeated periodically. And also please take note that the market will take its annual summer vacation Tuesday, June 28th and ending July 5th. So during this week's time, uh, markets close and the donation bins are also closed. So save your items for July 5th when the bins reopen, please. And next Monday is clearance. We will also feature some beautiful chinaware that we have received. And given the fact that today is the first day of summer, we'll have bathing suits and cover-ups. Um, upon the restart of the market, on July 11th, the china will still be on display along with jewelry and books. Later in the month, we will promote a variety of homeware or pajamas um, for the attire for the summer picnic on July 27th. As always, the market appreciates your donations, your purchases, and your contributions to the fun atmosphere on E-Level on Mondays. Thank you for your support. Now I'd like to reintroduce Connie. Hi, I'm Connie. Connie asked me to deliver on behalf of the nominating committee, which she chairs, our plea to you today. Horizon House is famous for being resident driven. It shows itself in our 70 plus grassroots committees and activities. And it manifests here in this room in your 15 person elected residence council. Council does three things. First, it coordinates and assists your committees, your discussion groups, your activities. Second, it funds them through the Monday market, thanks to our co-directors, Jennifer and Barbara, and a host of faithful volunteers that meet every week to prepare the market for us, the host of donors, you, and the shoppers. And third, the council serves as a two-way link between residents and management. In fact, the residents council president sits and votes on the board of trustees. About five years ago, I had the opportunity to attend uh, a luncheon with 25 residents council presidents from the entire Puget Sound area. About half of them were allowed to attend <clears throat> Board of Trustees meetings, but not vote. The other half didn't even get to attend. We were the lone outlier there. Our president not only attends, she has a full board vote. I just wanted to drop that in. We really are, it's part of the special sauce that we take for granted around here. So, Residence Council is not a social club. It's not just an honor to be elected. It's a working team. They organize, they coordinate, and they communicate on all residents' behalf. Each year, the council is renewed by electing five new members. <clears throat> Each member serves a three-year term. This process begins today with outreach to all of you. You will find a flyer in your cubbies asking you to suggest candidates for 2023 later this week or early next week. We're asking you to be talent scouts. How about that? Helping us to keep the council fresh, diverse, relevant. 
So as you move about Horizon House, please start thinking of residents who could be effective council members, including yourself. We'll contact everyone you list on the reply form. We'll interview those who are interested, consider the needs of the council, and bring you the best possible slate for your vote at the, atop, at the October meeting. So thank you. And at the end of your talk, I'm supposed to say, Marsha Brown, where are you? You have a spotlight talk. There you are right in front of me. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm going to, uh, I, I can't see, I can't see the, the slide, so I don't know what's going on. So I'm chair of the state tax issues committee, and uh, we changed our name this year to state tax and economy because we were having a lot of programs on the economy. Uh, on the board, we've listed the members, and I can't see them here, but I know they're, they're Bob Brown, Laura Weiss, Lynn Levine, Bill Anderson, Barbara Knight, Peter Shapiro, and not in the photo when it comes up are George Kenny, Karen Smith, and Adele Reynolds. Adele happened to have been working on, on our uh, Zoom uh, program with George, who's now getting captions with Risa, is helping me with that. Um, Adele is our Zoom hostess, and she provide, has been just indispensable with COVID and for our programs and our committee meetings. All right, we as a committee plan programs for all of us on ways to obtain fair, adequate, and sustainable taxes. And we are looking for getting a sustainable economy, of course, that goes along with that. Washington has the most regressive taxes, as you probably know. The low income people pay 17% of their household income on state and local taxes, and the rich pay two or 2.4%. So that's not fair. We do not have a personal income tax. I'm sure you know this. And as Don Burroughs, the uh, former uh, revenue department director uh, pointed out, as well as Dwight Dively, the King County budget director, we are just one, uh, one of seven states that do not have uh, income tax. And we're one of five states that do not have a corporate income tax. Now this makes it really hard for us to uh, have the amount of in revenue that we need for the services we wanna provide. Washington has tried 17 times to pass an income tax. Since 1932, it's been difficult because the courts decided income is the same as property. And so we have a lot of uh, several limitations on property taxes and that applies to income too. So if it's not uniformly applied, then it's declared unconstitutional. And it's only a 1% increase per year. So it doesn't keep up with inflation or population growth. These limitations make it hard for us to get enough revenue. Also since 1970, there's been this uh, uh, that problem of Politicians have learned that if you say no new taxes, they get elected. So that's been a, a hard to overcome too. And we have uh, one of the paramount duties of uh, the state is to provide funding for education. And we had a great deal of problems with that. And Marcy Maxwell, a former representative and Governor Inslee's education advisor was here talking about the McCleary decision and how we were trying to get more money to pay for basic education. And as you know, there was a thousand dollar a fine a day for uh, the legislature until they finally got 
uh, after two years, they got the property tax increased and they lowered the levies that people were in states or districts were allowed to um, make for maintenance and operation. Washington is 29th out of the 50 states in school funding. We, we put about 9,000, a little more, 9,000 per pupil per year. Uh, we're a rich state. We can do better than that. Building an inclusive economy to overcome the, the disparities of race and ethnicity, income and geography, an important issue that Jennifer Tran from the Washington School Budget and Policy Center was here talking about. And from uh, EOI, which is the Economic Opportunity Institute, Carolyn Brotherton was here talking about racial equity and taxes and why such a rich state underinvests in critical public services, especially that the historically oppressed people need. And now, another big problem besides regressive taxes is the extreme income and wealth inequality. With the booming globalization of trade, offshoring of labor and corporations, the free market economic philosophy with its lack of regulations, lack of taxes, and lack of unions. Unions now represent just 10% of the people. They were 25%. And if unions get better pay and, and services, other occupations, not unionized also get them. So that's Mark McDermott was here talking about that. And he says that the greater um, economic and social justice for all occurs when unions are involved. Then EOI director, John Burbank tried to get a, a city sales tax, a, a city income tax. If we could get that and the courts rule it's okay, then maybe we could get a personal income tax for the whole state. Um, and he was part of the, per, of the he was part of the originator of the city tax that finally did pass, which was on corporations that have employees with large salaries over 150,000 or 200,000 a year. And oh, 200,000 a year is what we're collecting now. And John Dalton in the paper said, he's very pleased the companies didn't leave and we are getting money for education. Uh, monopolies, mergers, and antitrust are a big concern of ours too. And the media uh, program that we had here recently uh, told about how if um, big companies take over a lot of papers, they lay off the reporters. We don't get local news, we only get national news. And that is detrimental to our democracy. Um, uh, the other thing we had was uh, a program on highlighting uh, the food banks. Uh, and National Geographic pointed out we have a huge insufficiency of food in, in many places. And here in Seattle, with the COVID and with uh, inflation, you can see on the bulletin board uh, lines of people now uh, going to food banks to get money, uh, to get food for uh, their families. Peter Shapiro is now going to talk about the programs we've had on homelessness. Peter, while you're arriving, did we get to see the photos, all three of the photos that she sent mm -hmm. for them? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, uh, Betty. Uh, Pleasure to be with you again. It's been a while but since I've been on the podium with a microphone. Raised the raised microphone and lower the mask. Uh, I'm gonna talk about seven hours worth of programming and it's close to uh, an hour or two as possible. No, I mean about 70 seconds as possible. Um, uh, the first one I mentioned is one about permanent supportive housing. It's a concept you probably know about. It's become recognized as being the only way in which we can help chronically homeless people get out of their situation. And at the same time, it's been proved that it saves money for society. It costs more 
to keep people homeless than it does to house them. That's been proven. So we have, we're fortunate to have the uh, executive director of the downtown emergency service uh, center, which was the developer of this concept, tell us about it. The next was what I call a crowdsourced set of programs. It was interesting and I'll, you see what I mean. Uh, the committee decided to invite the uh, main proponent of the proposed charter amendment. You might remember last spring, uh, the, there was an organization calling itself uh, Seattle Compassion. And they had a proposal for a charter amendment, which would direct the city council to take certain steps with regard to revenue and with regard to budgeting and regard to homeless uh, programs. Eventually courts threw that out for, for technical reasons, but it lives on in the presence of a mayor uh, who uh, has adopted most of the concepts of the proposed uh, charter amendment in his program uh, as Mayor Harrell. Um, so that then I think believe prompted Mike Ostrom to invite the uh, president of the downtown uh, service association uh, to present his talk, views about the issue and to talk about a lot, a lot of very interesting statistics about how uh, the downtown is faring as it comes out of, or trying to come out of the uh, pandemic. Uh, that prompted members of the committee to say, we have a couple of other things that we think we need to bring to the table to elucidate what's going on. And the, the first speaker was uh, the economist, Katie Wilson, uh, also executive director of the Transit uh, Writers Union, uh, but who's written a lot of columns about homelessness. And she explained more details about what it is and what the issues are and how difficult it is to work them. And then we ended uh, with an invitation to Alison Eisinger, who is the uh, executive director for, for quite a few years of the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness, an organization of about 60 constituent members who are all involved in providing services. And Allison knows probably more about homelessness than anybody I have ever encountered uh, in, in, with regard to what's going on in the city. So that was the crowdsourced series of programs, uh, four one hour plus presentations, and I covered them in 60 seconds. Uh, it's clear that housing, homelessness is a housing issue. Think of the, uh, old the game we used to play in kindergarten and maybe in high school or college, <laughs> musical chairs. You start, start with ten, uh, ten con uh, contestants and nine chairs. Well, guess what? Nine people sit down and one doesn't. And then that goes on where well, the same principle applies to a society where there is not enough housing for everybody. It's simple. So there's a book about that. And uh, I urge you to read, read that. So thank you very much for your attention. Good to see you all again. And now Wilton Fowler, I turn the microphone over to you. Good morning. This will be the shortest speech you'll hear this morning. I'm just here to introduce the chair of the sewing room uh, Karen Gwynham, who was going to give us a very nice and very colorful display. Karen? Thank you for inviting me. I here because of we're in a small room and can't have big playing things to be showing. But I have brought two different types of quilts that we are making. This one is polar face on both sides and it's very warm. The second one is a quilt. The second one is from the, um, the scraps left from the pajamas and then the polar fleece in the back. So we would don't waste any fabric, period. <laughs> then we're also making scarves. 
scarves and hats and mittens out of polar fleece. So that goes many places. And last but not least is we have, I have some pajamas that we are making. This is all ages. So we have three different sizes here that I brought. That's it. For the new people, the sewing room is on B2, open 24 hours a day. There are four sewing machines, two sergers, and our new quilting machine. We are here to help you get acquainted with each item. We are just training now before using the quilting machine. There are many supplies available, thread, needles, scissors, pins, iron, and ironing board. Iron and iron board is open to anybody. Open for you to use. There are many donated fabrics that are open for you to use also. There's a group of sewers working every Wednesday. This is what I'm talking about for making sewing items. And on Saturday, they make the quilts. This is a new setup because there was not enough room in the, to cut out pan pajamas and quilts at the same time. So we're separated. They need a full table for quilts and as well as sewers. The people we are serving ask for more quilts and some more, more hats and mittens. Our production is given to Mary's Place, Youth Care, Plymouth Housing, and Harborview Outpatient Clinics. We serve new babies and families through all ages at Mary's Place. Youth Care serves all teenagers. They need the most quilts. Plymouth Housing is adults only, with 80% men, 20% women. They like all the items for adults. Plymouth Housing is adding more and more housing. I believe there are 18 buildings now. I do not know how many apartments they have. <clears throat> they like the hats, scarves, and mittens, and some large vests that we make. Harborview serves homeless people coming to outpatient clinics, mainly dental clinic that want hats and mittens and scarves. COVID interfered with, interrupted us for a while. And last year we delivered only 348 items. Our goal is higher, around 500 items. We have been on two budgets. The residence council funds go for equipment, maintenance of our equipment, and funding to, in using for contracts so that we can re have each sewing machine re-adjusted every year and not charged. Our second budget comes from Horizon House. We use this money to buy all our fabric, polar fleece, flannel, and quilting fiber for warmth. We use almost every bit of fabric scraps of pajamas, go on quilts, as well as some polar fleece scraps are made for pictures on quilts. Very little scraps go to Goodwill to be flattened for felt blankets. People come to help with sewing items, either clothing or quilts. There's always joy in the room. We do provide for each person's interest, cutting, serging, or sewing, or hand, uh, hand work, whichever they would like to do. It is such a joy to see how happy the recipients re accept. We will, well, as just finishing what you'd like to do. You are very much able to see what we are doing on either Wednesday afternoon or Saturday afternoon. We are open for more people. COVID has set us behind, but we are back at working. We will take July off if the sun comes out. Now I heard today the sun's coming out. <laughs> Otherwise, August off. There was a group of people who help people with repairs. There's a group of people who help people with repairs of items. That team has retired. I will begin setting up a new group to buy fall. There is a woman who comes once a month on Tuesdays to help with projects. Um, I think it's the second Tuesday um, with projects on the on Tuesdays from seven to nine. 
There are beautiful quilts hanging outside our room. That changes about once a month. All are made by our Horizon House friends. Some of them um, who are, have made in years past or something that they keep themselves, but we do show quilts there. And now I would like to introduce Joan Hudson. Joan Hudson, right here. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, actually, before I begin my remarks today, I have to say what an honor it is to be in the same room with Dr. Wilton B. Fowler. Um, I majored in history at the University of Washington. And without doubt, Dr. Fowler was my favorite professor. I never imagined that my path would cross with his one day again. But isn't that the way with Horizon House? So many unforeseen connections. Dr. Fowler, I haven't worked up the courage to call you Will. <laughs> if I haven't completely embarrassed you, I'd like to thank you for being a superlative, kind, and inspiring educator. So, you can hear me, right? So, um, I noticed that on the agenda, um, Elizabeth Hoover just put down remarks by the communication manager. So, she probably did that because I've heard there's a new committee, the Tar and Feather Committee. And so she was probably hoping that I wouldn't be run out on a rail today if I talked about HHTV. So, ooh, my notes. So, HHTV. And as communications manager, I'm just here to communicate with you about HHTV. Um, and what the heck is going on with it? At past fireside chats, I've talked about the different platforms or channels we use to communicate with you at Horizon House, whether it's the alert, HH Connect, email, vast mass voicemails, paper notices in cubbies, etc. Well, we have another platform by which we communicate with you, and that is K4. Okay, everybody's heard the term K4, right? Um, I've presented at past fireside chats about K4. And first of all, just remember that K4 is not a thing. It's a company. It's a company like, for example, GE, who makes uh, appliances, microwaves, ranges, refrigerators. K4 is a company that makes technology tools for senior communities. So at K4, the components are HHTV, which is in red because it's a hot topic and it's what I'm talking about today. Digital signage that you see on HHTV or in the displays around Horizon House. Alexa voice, which plays through an echo dot in your apartment. And the mobile app, which allows you to have lots of information at your fingertips on a phone, tablet, and at Horizon House, even on a computer. So these components work together as an integrated system to provide consistent information for you. The staff uses an administrative team hub 
to manage notices, do the email delivery status, dining menus, events, digital signage, and HHTV programming. So what powers HHTV is something called K4 Direct Broadcast. As our tech director, Brian Levitt says, really, it's a simple robot. It basically does what it's programmed to do. So let's take a look at HHTV K4 Direct Broadcast. Whoa, gasp, it looks like a microwave. So it does not look very fancy, does it? Okay, this unit sits in a little back office just off the front desk. And because of its proximity and the importance of front desk to events and, and programs that go on, they operate HHTV. So now let's look under the hood. Okay, again, not real fancy. The white box you see is the brains, it's the computer. And up above where you see the hand on the DVD, that is where the DVD player is. Okay, so all of the programs are scheduled to play on HHTV. They're programmed by staff for a week ahead of time. So it's those just don't play it by themselves. The computer, the team hub is where we schedule everything that plays on HHTV. So the program schedule dictates what's going to play. It might be the exercise video, which is a YouTube link, or it might be a movie, which is a DVD. So when a program isn't playing, the system reverts to the rotation of signage that you see on the screen. Make sense? Okay, good. So what could possibly go wrong? First, um, here's an odd point of pride, and it, it's an odd point of pride. Um, Horizon House, as you know, is a, an incredibly active place. So we're pushing the envelope on the system, introducing a complexity of programming that most senior committees, communities don't have the discussion groups, the programs, the meetings, the DVDs, the lectures, the movies. Um, we're really pushing the envelope. So although the front desk does check the DVDs when there are, there are still things that can go wrong, like little scratches that prevent a movie from playing, for example. But here's an interesting one. We, some lectures like the history lectures, have chapters, all right? The system's not set up to play unique chapters from a DVD, but by gum, we do it here at Horizon House. Sometimes it's glitchy and difficult. We have lots of YouTube links that play on HHTV. So something can happen in the computer and a link won't play the video. That happened a couple of months ago. And then at the bottom there, we have just glitches. Stuff happens. We all know that technology breaks. Um, however, the recent spate of particularly the DVD malfunctions have been incredibly frustrating for you. And we just want to acknowledge <laughs> that we know it's incredibly frustrating. And let me tell you, it's incredibly frustrating for us because we want things to work for you. So let me give you a, a real life example of what it's like when something goes wrong. Okay, front desk person finds out that a DVD is not playing. All right, they troubleshoot. They go into the team hub and check for any scheduling errors. Okay, that looks fine, no problem, let's go on. They check and clean the disc to make sure that that's okay, but it still won't play. Okay, then they go into the team hub and reset the time to play. 
That's why sometimes you'll see a program starting at 718. <laughs> it's because they have to reset it and then there's a little buffer of time. But it still won't play. Well, then we go back into the team hub and recreate the entire event. Oh, still won't play. Last resort, they reboot the entire system. Uh, won't play. We have a problem. We have a real problem. Let's call K4 support. And that's what we do. And then we wait for some solutions. Now, while all of this activity is going on, the phone might ring. Well, if it's not 10 residents calling the front desk to tell them that the DVD won't play, it might be someone with an emergency. So we can't not answer the phone. Um, so then somebody might be at the front desk with a burning question. Well, just wait. We, I'm rebooting the system. Okay. <laughs> or there's somebody at the front door waiting to get in. Sorry, I'm busy right now. So it's, as you can see, the front desk is not eating bonbons when something goes wrong. It can get a little complicated. So going forward, Risa Ransom, who manages the front desk and the front desk team have worked really, really hard to be on top of the operational game. And from that preceding example, it's just a little taste of the kinds of things that they do. To support them when things go awry, especially on weekends when everything seems to go wrong, we've instituted an improved communication system available so that reception, events and programs, IT and communication all know at the same time what's happening. And what that does for us is it allows us to communicate with you on a more timely basis when something goes wrong. Now, also, depending upon when an issue with HHTV happens, either communications, myself or Emily Wallace, um, or on the weekends, the front desk, we will be posting signage on HHTV to let you know it's broken or a delay, Hang on, um, but here's the deal. You have to stay in front of HHTV and let the rotation of signs go through. If you just get frustrated and turn it off, then you may not hear from us because you haven't waited to watch what's going on, okay? So let's make that deal. So to sum it all up, our profound apologies for all of the issues. Unfortunately, we can't just throw out the system. As I understand, there's only a couple of alternatives out there and they use the same technology. So it doesn't, it doesn't pay for us to do something different. Last week, Brian Levitt um, provided a detailed summary in an email of all the various HHTV problems that have occurred. If any of you would care to have a copy of that, I have some copies uh, that you can take with you. Um, other than that, um, I just really wanna thank you for your time and I hope this has helped in some small way. Last, I know Deanna Nelson of the Resident Technology Committee wanted me to um, reiterate that right now there is one-to-one -one K4 app training. So if you want to get on the mobile app, you can sign up in the mail room and a resident tech committee member will come to train you, okay? With that, I am finished. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, I always forget this part. Next is another Joan, Joan Bowers. Thank you, Joan. So proud to be part of the four-member Joan Committee at Horizon House. Um, I'm here to talk about the post-pandemic pajama picnic. And I tried to get Zoa Shumway up here, but she had other plans. So 
Uh, she is our resident uh, enthusiast about parties. And she would really set you on your heels about what's going to happen in the next month. Okay, so I'll, I'll do my best, but recognize that I'm not Zoa. Okay, there have been a couple of major questions have come up over the past month, month and a half. And the first of those is, why did we need, why do we need to change? And the question has a couple simple answers. You may recall that last year, the, uh, <laughs> I saw a, a sad look on Devin's face. <laughs> anyway, you may recall that last year, we had temperatures in, this, in our real summer, ranging from 90 to 104 degrees. And as a consequence for the picnic last year and possibly in years before when I wasn't here, the administration paid for the rental of tents or umbrellas, you can call them whichever you like, uh, to provide more shade on the patio where the picnic was going to be held. Well, last year, the cost was $4,000. And I built a 7% inflationary amount into the budget that I requested. We got the response from the tent rental company, and it had been elevated to 7,500 plus, plus a few dollars probably. So that was an easy decision. When a, someone went to Mike, I wasn't uh, privy to this meeting. Someone went to Mike and he said, no way. <laughs> so we had to revise, we had to and uh, adjust our plans. So Oliver was, Oliver um, who manages the, um, is the, <laughs> Catering, thank you. It's one of those minutes. Um, manages the catering for the dining room, and so he was the appropriate person. But he took it took um, the leadership for us in coming up with the resolution, and that was he measured off when the shade occurs on the uh, garden patio, and how much of the um, shade would be available at different times of the day. And so the obvious thing to do was to have the um, event happen in mid-morning when there's most likely to be shading from the various buildings around us. And so here's where we are. We're having a brunch instead of a real formal picnic, if picnics can be formal. Um, and then the second question was, oh, what shall I wear? What, what do I wear if it's a pajama event? So first answer to that question is wear what you want to, whatever that is. Um, well, we might frown a little bit on bikini bathing suits, but at any rate, stylish nightwear, anything else, Bermuda shorts, moo-moos, or moo moo excuse me. And as Jennifer had uh, told you earlier, Monday Market has obliged with planning a, sale, um, a featuring sale of this kind of clothing for the, uh, 20, the 18th and the 25th. So be there early and get what you may want of what's available. Wear your new stylish clothes if you want to, to the event. Reservations are opening on the 17th of July. Janet Daggett has kindly agreed to handle that. And she wants emails or notes. Absolutely no phone calls, please. And I believe this is pretty consistent with reservation processing. So, Come one, come all, plan on having fun. Um, 
And let's see if we can make it something that will be fun that can be done in future years, because I know, I know the price of the tents is not going down next year. So come and have a good time. And I introduce Doris Ray, who's going to talk about the Dining Services Committee. I haven't had a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Pardon? What was the date of the picnic? 27th. The 27th of July at 10 o'clock, did you say? 10.30. 10.30 on the 28th of July. Is that right? 27th, excuse me. If you come on the 28th, you're going to be late. Could I just say one more thing? Sure. One, one. I should have told you that all of this detailed information about the price, the meal, and all of these other kinds of details that you might be interested in will be printed and passed out to everyone, as well as being on computer. Thank you. Thank you. The Dining Services Committee provides a systematic method of communication with individual residents through um, informal meetings on the Monday afternoon before the monthly residents council meeting and again on Tuesday after the meeting here in the Fireside Lounge to answer questions, uh, take comments from individual residents. Uh, specific information about these meetings is posted in the alert. And we of course will be at a table after this meeting someplace here in the Fireside Lounge, probably over in that area. And there will be a sign, which I have brought with me. We're also hoping to make information available on HH Connect on the of interest column on the left-hand side. And we will be posting information uh, after the monthly dining services committee meetings. So look for that. It's not quite set up yet, but we hope to have it very shortly. So a couple of recent questions and comments from uh, responses from um, the uh, staff and others uh, were, let me give you a couple of examples. Why, why are half sandwiches not sold in the bistro? And the answer, the response is, most people want whole sandwiches. The, the kitchen prepares and sells, the kitchen prepares and sells 50 to 100 sandwiches daily. When the bistro runs out, often by noon, more of them must be made. And preparing a whole sandwich is less time consuming than preparing two half sandwiches. And of course, you have heard about staff shortages. But the resident can save the half not eaten for later consumption or share it with someone else. Another question was, packaged sandwiches and salads usually contain mayonnaise, mustard, or salad dressing which are often thrown away by the resident. Why not just place them in a bowl on the counter for residents who want them to pick up? And the response has been, interestingly, that prior experience has shown that when condiments such as mayonnaise, salad dressing, et cetera, are left on the counter, they're picked up by the handfuls. 
not only by those who are buying sandwiches and salads. If they're there, they must be free. We'll just take a few with us. And so that, of course, becomes considerably more costly to leave it on the counter. So if you have a question or comment, please look for me at one of these tables after the meeting. And today, I suspect it will be over there. Look for the sign. Thank you. Oh, yes. And next is Nancy Cope speaking on behalf of the Vice President for Administration. Nancy. Oh, my, oh, my. When Carol Roach called me and said, I'm not in town on this day, would you read my questions and answer? And I thought, oh, easy task, easy task. My friend Diane looked at the three single spaced papers that Carol gave me and said, Nancy, summarize, <laughs> summarize. So I'm going to summarize if you don't mind. The first question had to do with the quality of your TV picture. Devin has said everybody gets the same signal. If you're having quality problems with your TV, get a fix it man he suggested peel comes to your apartment and looks at the contrast and adjusts the tv set for contrast second question and this is i need to stand up tall because it has to do with microphones and everybody's very nervous about not handling the microphones correctly and getting instructions so the second question was answered by, of course, our brilliant Risa Ransom, and she approached Pat Fritz, who is with the Events Support Committee, and Risa reminds all residents hosting or sponsoring meetings and events to do the following. Number one, complete the reserve request form when you're finished. Number two, would be if you arrive at your meeting and discover the room is not set up as requested, go to the front desk and get some help immediately. Number three is we do have a post event form that we request be completed and left with the concierge. So those are answers from, and I have summarized folks. <laughs> so if you need more, but Hold your hats. The third question, I have got to read it. The third question was posed to Hunter at the front desk, who is beginning a new Horizon House position after a stint as concierge. And the question is, what do you hope lies ahead for you in, say, 15 years? The answer from Hunter, I'd just like to be happy. <laughs> I thought that was a great answer. And for me, he says, happiness would involve using my time and energy day to day to help reverse the money-driven machines that powers much of government and private life. Now, oh, a little political statement there from Hunter. I want to be able to go to sleep every night knowing that I am using my life to put some good out there. Those are the questions. I don't think I'll be hired for this again. <laughs> Thanks. Just one more thing, one more brief thing. Uh, all of us have been affected by the distressing news in our media about our national and international issues, including inflation, shootings all over the country, even prolonged pandemic and construction restrictions right here in our home. It's within our will, however, as individuals, to counter the bad news as best we can 
with deliberate intention. So to conclude our meeting today, here's some good advice, which we could try to follow, written by Johnny Mercer. Most of you are from, probably familiar with this piece of music. So join, join Sally Wren and me in singing it. Let's show that slide. Let's loosen up now and sing the words together. You've, You've got, got to accent the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, and don't mess with Mr. In Between. You've got to spread joy up to the maximum, bring gloom down to the minimum, and have faith. Or pandemonium is liable to walk upon the scene. To illustrate the last remark, Jonah in the whale, Noah in the mar ark. What did they do just when everything looked so down? Everybody. Man, Man, they said we got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, and don't mess with Mr. In Between. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> That's it, folks. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks so much. <laughs>